Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I could uh, have your attention, we might get started. My name is Alicia, I'll be your MC. For those of you who joined us at the last showcase, uh, welcome back. Um, it's wonderful to have you here with us again today. For those of you joining us for the first time, <laughs> so, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to Geoscience Australia for our final Digital Earth Australia Public Showcase of 2019. We want this showcase to be a chance for everyone here to engage with us, which is why we'll pause for questions following each of the presentations, so I ask you to please hold your questions until that time. Uh, there will also be a number of Digital Earth Australia staff who will hang around after the showcase, so please come up, introduce yourselves, have a chat. Um, and most importantly, let us know what you thought of the showcase and how we can do better for the program in 2020. For this showcase, we have four speakers and topics which represent many aspects of the Digital Earth Australia program and our recent achievements um, and how we deliver the program. It is a full agenda, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, David Gavin, the Director of DEA Technologies. Dave's going to talk to us about the recent advances, advances in digital earth technology and how this is driving DEA towards a more productive <laughs> and capable platform. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you, all, all of you, for taking the time out to, um, to come listen to us today. Uh, so, in February of this year, the Helmsley Charitable Trust and the Australian Government announced a $17 million co-investment into the creation of an Earth Observation Exploitation Platform for Africa. Uh, we entitled the uh, program uh, Creatively Digital Earth Africa. <laughs> it wouldn't be confusing for anybody. <laughs> and uh, the decision was made that its initial establishment would be coordinated by Geoscience Australia, based on the success uh, and progress that Digital Earth Australia had, has been making. So one of the first questions was, why did we use uh, AWS for Digital Earth Africa? Uh, there was a lot of contention, there were a lot of other op options for this. Um, but primarily for Digital Earth Africa, the goal is to make use of analysis-ready data as provided by uh, upstream satellite providers, rather than generating our own satellite, da uh, satellite data and analysis-ready data like we do in Australia. We understand that that's a pretty huge burden for Digital Earth, Australia, uh, Digital Earth Africa to take on into the future, and it was a key goal in terms of sustainability that this data uh, is already available to the platform. So Synergize, a Slovenian company on behalf of the European Com Commissions, already hosts Sentinel-2 data in AWS. USGS is targeting AWS as its uh, deployment for its new uh, Landsat collection that we're expecting next year. We are expecting an AWS region to become available in Cape Town early next year. And uh, in terms of how we store and distribute the data, the EO community is already very active in terms of embracing object stores and HTTP streaming. So things like AWS S3 or Google Object Store or really a HTTP endpoint. You no longer have to download your data, you can just stream it. And to be honest, it, this was, uh, it was a perfect parallel to the strategic direction of Digital Earth Australia. That we have been moving over the last two years towards more of a cloud-focused capability so that we can have, a, uh, have an infrastructure that people can take for granted. I mean, that's the proposition to government and to industry for Digital Earth Australia, that this is something that we can take for granted. So as I've already said, uh, the big target is to make all of the data for Digital Earth Africa public and available and open, uh, and to make sure that tools or standards are optional for how you interact with the data. So we're opinionated. We have the Open Data Cube. We have OGC, or Open Geospatial Consortium Web, web Services. But there's nothing stopping you from bringing ESRI-based tools or any other equivalent or an AWS serverless approach, all of which are very active in this ecosystem. So it was really key to this uh, solution architecture that things are 
open and that at each level of this stack, people can substitute their own pieces. As I'm, uh, the other key point that we wanted to, um, uh, that we really wanted to deliver was uh, to have an environment where we could rapidly and our users could rapidly interact with this data via Python. Now, there are, once again, other competing technologies out there. There's, it's worth acknowledging the Google Earth engine. It has a similar platform. Other commercial uh, data providers, satellite data providers are providing their own APIs. Uh, but this was something that we knew we could build and support, at least in the interim, uh, and making this environment open to users to come in and play with the data without having to download it first. We have leaned in some way to the AWS's serverless components in terms of having workflows that are driven by S3 events. So when data appears in a bucket, it tricks it, uh, it kicks off uh, further downstream processing. So we don't have to rely upon things happening at the right time. They happen at the point when the data comes in. And uh, we have focused on building all of our applications and algorithms and having them deployable and shareable via Docker images. Uh, so that was key to being able to parallelize and produce data so fast. Within all of this, we've used Amazon's new EKS service. We chose Kubernetes um, as a Docker orchestration tool because of the fantastic community support, not just in AWS, but across Google and other platforms. Um, and we moved from a self-managed Kubernetes to EKS because it saved us a lot of headache and meant that AWS was taking care of a lot of the things that we didn't want to. And key to the success of this was being able to use a combination of reserved spot and on-demand instances for the right kinds of workflow. So if we're doing large continental scale processing that doesn't happen very often, we can take advantage of the spot market for a third of the cost of doing something on on-demand. And if we have a, an enduring web service that we always want up, we can pay for that in advance once again, about a third of the cost that you would and on, on, for on-demand. So we received, actually, we agreed at the point of, uh, of the, at the inception of Digital Earth Africa, we agreed that the target for a major release was uh, the Geoministerial Summit in Canberra this year. So we knew that we wanted to produce a water classifier for all of Africa by November 4. As it turned out, we didn't get the data that we needed for this until October 1st, um, which gave us 30 days to reformat this data into a more cloud-native format. So this, was, this is to make it easier to retrieve data randomly without having to stream the whole file into memory first, and also allowed us to uh, compress uh, and dramatically cut down the cost in S3. We needed to produce new workflows that could work on our existing infrastructure in Australia and the NCI that would also work in, work in AWS. And we needed a new approach to uh, generating summary products. So in those 30 days, we, pro we processed six years of Landsat 8 for the African continent, which was over 30,000 scenes. This included the optimization, the generation of the water classifier, of our ground cover classifier, of our water summaries that are far more intuitive to immediately see how often something is wet or not, uh, to produce a very charming cloud-free mosaic, and to make, ALOS, uh, and make some ALOS data available. This currently costs us uh, about $2,400 US a month in storage, but was $1,200 to process it. And it's worth reflecting on those costs because the time, the amount of human power that goes into this far exceeds any of these costs. Like once upon a time, this, uh, these numbers for processing and for storage were prohibitive and that you could just throw more people at it. Now it's a matter of this is kind of a solved problem and we can just take advantage of it and we can focus on all of the the $17 million budget for Africa on building capacity rather than on building infrastructure. And this may or may not play. And I'm not going to give it a chance. 
So this is Digital Earth Africa as seen through uh, Data61's Terrier platform. So for those who are not familiar with uh, working with satellite imagery, this is typically what it looks like on a day-to-day. -day. It's really cloudy, it's patchy. We can only ever classify parts of it. With enough images, we can create a classifier for an entire continent. You can go see the Nile and see how it fared over a year. You can go see Mauritan a lake in Mauritania that I didn't get time to look up. Um, <laughs> And then we can uh, admire it all in its uh, natural beauty. But for those of us who are working with the data every day, oh, come on. <laughs> this is typically how we would do it would log into a Python-enabled Jupyter Hub that has access to all of the data. We would write whatever our business logic is, and we can iterate quickly, we can fail quickly, we can succeed quickly. So this is a, just an animation of a man-made um, lake in Mali that uh, I actually created the animation for another presentation a long time ago, but just the example of just how fast it is to just go do something useful in an environment like this, or at least, well, useful is a bit of me. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going? And so what does it mean for Australia? So we're immediately, in fact today, putting to use a lot of the framework that we've built. So already a month out, we are producing our two first products for Australia within AWS using all of the technologies and all of the stuff that we've learned from what we did for, for Africa. Uh, we have determined as part of the NCI upgrade, we're actually going to be able to reuse a lot of that, well, which was always the target, but it's pleasant to know that, that NCI will be enabling a Docker-like environment, and that's going to be something that we're going to be focusing on sharing uh, algorithms and software through. Uh, by building in a way that was really familiar to us and by using the tools that we built to build the success, it means that not only can our product developers within Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa, but users from all over the world can use this to generate reports, derive new insights, build new products, which is, always, which is the ultimate goal of any EO exploitation platform. And while the cost savings are impressive, the, the fact that we were able to do that in a month was incredible, to be able to produce a continental scale coverage of six years. And look, we're pretty confident that when all of the data, when the 30 years of data is available, uh, mid next, well, early next year, <laughs> at some point next year, we'll be able to repeat that. And we know how much it cost us to do this, and we'll aim at reducing it. So that's an interesting question for, for Australia, where we, we have the potential of streaming the ARD from NCI. I think using the current public internet, would, that probably wouldn't work for. But NCI have indicated that we could do perhaps a direct connect. And that's something that we could, uh, re, that's a conversation that we could reignite. Uh, it really depends on the product. I mean, some of our derivative products are really building blocks for other things. And obviously, that's where we're well positioned right now. Uh, as part of our DEA labs, we have a fairly sizable chunk of Sentinel-2 ARD data available in AWS, from which we are deriving a number of products currently. So it's a, it's a bit of a watch this space. I think a more confronting question will be uh, middle of next year when all of this data for the entire planet is available in AWS. What does that mean for Digital Earth Australia? 
uh, which is still producing ARD4. Is that a deliberate segue to my talk? Yeah. Any more questions for Dave? No, you are off the hook. No, he's not. I'll go again. You go again. <laughs> Uh, so, so just, just on that, for Africa, what I heard was you had to reprocess, reformat the US GS data. Is the expectation that their global ARD collection will need reformatting as well? Or be Absolutely not. So uh, US GS uh, cut a uh, corner for us to get the data more quickly. They were still uh, finalising on formats and metadata standards, uh, and we needed the data to to produce, and we knew how we were going to, we were familiar with reformatting this code. That was a once off, and that's not something that um, people are going to need to do. In fact, that's a very strong message. Please don't do that. <laughs> Trent? Uh, so, Dave, obviously, we've leaned into AWS um, for, for Africa for a, a few very good reasons in terms of the, the way the community's going at the moment. You did talk about Google Earth Engine as a another platform. Uh, of course, the Google Cloud more, more generally is, a, is another significant platform that people are using. Uh, what, where do you see us going in terms of, of this world where, where there is more than one major cloud platform that, uh, that users are wanting to go to? So fundamentally, I see the, and this, this could be at odds with reality, um, but fundamentally, I see the, the roles of uh, Digital Earth Africa and Digital Earth Australia in really about enabling insight off um, Earth observation data. So it's not a matter of endorsing NCI or AWS or Google or even endorsing the software that we produce, the Open Data Cube. So long as there is a way for users to get that insight, that's what we're really ultimately driving and enabling. When the time is right, when the, the value proposition is right, Either replicating or moving to Google is something that we're ready to do. Um, we have not, we're not quite as advanced or confident around Azure. Ironically enough, we're a bit more confident around more open stack alternatives. But the important thing is the data and the algorithms and that things are open. presenter is uh, one that you'll be familiar with from last showcase. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Trevor Jew, the branch head for the National Earth and Marine Observations Branch, who's going to provide us with an update on the Landsat Collection Upgrade project currently underway. Thank, Thank you, you Trevor. Uh, so for those of you who were here last week, uh, sorry, last showcase, my apologies. Apparently I did a good enough job of making something that is fundamental but at its heart a little bit boring interesting enough that I've been asked for a repeat performance with how we're we going now. So actually what you're going to see here is very similar to what I showed last showcase, only with a few more numbers on how we've actually gone against it. So for those who don't know what we're talking about in terms of the uh, Landsat upgrade, first thing to understand is what, what is, when we talk about our Landsat collection, what is it? And it is 30 years worth of data. Uh, 20, I'm glad Dave only talked in scenes because I now sound like I've got much more data uh, in Australia. We're much more important. We have 20 trillion pixels. For each one of those pixels, we have roughly seven measurements, individual measurements of the spectra. So there's about 140 trillion measurements of Australia's landscape that we have sitting in our collection that continues to update every time the Landsat sensors come across. Uh, the decision we made, if you think about how we produce that data today, and Dave gave us a bit of an um, insight into this when he talked about Africa. In Africa, we took the data directly from the USGS. They produced the ARD. We reformatted it a little bit, but basically it's their measurements, their data. In Australia, we do it a little bit differently at the moment. So right now, we get the base satellite observations as the satellite saw it, and then we do a whole bunch of work internally to locate the pixels on the ground and then to clean up any other noise, cloud, etc. Um, in our, the problem with that is we know where the future is going to take us. We know that in three, five years from now, the USGS, the European Space Agency, UMETSAT and others will be producing analysis-ready data that actually should be fit for purpose in Australia, and we need to start moving ourselves towards that. So we've taken what is a very, very complicated but comparatively small step of now actually taking the data 
the location step we're taking straight from the USGS and we're only taking responsibility for correcting for atmosphere, for water, identifying clouds. So that's a change in our pipeline and we're doing it for the whole lot. We're going back for the full 30 years, reprocessing, cleaning it up and we're actually planning to run both of those collections in parallel for at least the next six months and depending on our user feedback possibly a little bit longer. I says looking at Department of the Environment and Energy quite deliberately, um, but basically making sure that people are comfortable that their applications can move directly across to this new collection, and then at some point in time we'll turn our current collection off. So that's, that is what we're trying to do with the Landsat Archive, and we're really, it's as much as anything about positioning Australia to take advantage of these global advances in how satellite operators are thinking about producing this sort of data. So three months ago, I basically showed this with a couple of other animations. How have we gone in three months? Pretty well, I would say, if I can move forward. Uh, we've processed 134 trillion measurements, I'm very happy to say. So roughly 96% of the data has been processed. Um, it's all gone through, it's gone through a whole bunch of testing, however, the key next step, and I guess the appeal to anyone in this room who's got applications, there are now 134 trillion measurements of the new Landsat data sitting on the NCI, available through Threads, and we would love for you to go and engage with it, start testing it, testing that it works with your systems, identifying things that you are concerned about with it, and giving us that feedback. Um, I point out that the remaining 4% is the obvious question. Why did you stop at 96? Um, a couple of reasons. The, the reality is processing a single data set that big, any number of little quirks can come up as you're doing it. It actually basically means a scene or an observation doesn't process. Equally, we did a bulk reprocess. So we actually have the job now of effectively automating that and making sure that we're keeping it up to date with the collection too. Um, so we effectively have almost two synchronised divers with our measurements going through time. So we've got a bit of work to do that on the next three months. However, there is a vast continental archive of what this new data will look like sitting there, available for everybody to use, and more importantly, everybody to give us feedback as to whether or not it's going to be fit for what you use our data for. I just point out the other job we've got to do is we've done a whole bunch of testing on the products that we produce off that Landsat data. However, they've all been tested um, to differing levels and all on subsets of the collection. So the other big job for us in the next three months is to really test how do these work when you're considering the entire continental archive, not just the small areas that we did our testing on. So that'll be another big piece of work for the DEA program and that'll take us some time. That's why we're keeping both collections up and running for the next six months so that we've got that time to make sure everyone, including ourselves, is comfortable that we can produce the insights we produce today off our Landsat data off this new Landsat archive. Uh, and so I'll wrap up. If you want to know more about the changes, again, this was a link there last time, but there is a YouTube video that talks about the, the detail of what's actually changing in the archive with far more insight than I could ever offer you. Um, it's there. Please have a look at it. Um, and otherwise, please feel free to get in touch with us if you've got questions, concerns, or things you'd like to understand, or even how you'd like to get to the data to have a look at it. That's me. Thank you very much. Hard to generate enthusiasm on that. Can I, in which case, I will just add one other comment. This is the sort of work that I guess through these showcases we want to keep highlighting because it is, to be, to be blunt, it's the very unsexy foundational work off which everything else hangs. So it is, it is a critically important piece of our program. We've invested a lot of energy in this and we'll continue to because we fully appreciate getting this data right is what everyone relies upon us to do um, until such time as we can take it confidently from the satellite operators. Cool, thank you. Oh, I was oh, so close. Yeah, I'm going to go to the question then. So the International Committee on Monitoring Satellites has actually developed a specification for analysis of data. Uh, and how long before Australia is happy with that specification? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not entirely convinced of the relevance of that committee, Adam. So, <laughs> no, um, so in all honesty, this, this collection upgrade will get us over the base level for that. So that will give us compliance with um, the, the CIOS analysis ready data for land standard is the one Adam's talking about. And it actually has two categories. You have a threshold and a target. I'm looking at Madhavi because I always mix those up. I think threshold is a slightly lower base level everyone should aspire to get to for their ARD. 
This collection upgrade will get us over that threshold. We won't yet be at target, Adam, um, and my understanding is actually some of those processes, there's a whole bunch of work, particularly around uncertainty, that is going to take us a long time. In all honesty, and possibly my team should cover their ears, I reckon we'll be using international data before we get over the target level, but this collection upgrade will absolutely get us to threshold. Yes, please. Um, any insight into the future of changes of resolution? So, greater resolution, like what's the projection? Yeah, so within the Landsat environment, I mean, Landsat 9 is about to go up and it'll be essentially exactly the same. There's a live pro, um, process at the moment around Landsat called Landsat Next, where we're actually expecting an announcement out of the US. I was hoping before the end of year, it's probably going to be early next calendar year, sitting, seeing where we're at, that'll actually talk about what their target architecture for Landsat Next, Landsat 10, is going to be. And there is, to be honest, there's a live debate in the science community between continuity through time versus advances in what you can see, what you can measure. Um, and I don't, they, they are playing that because it's a commercial process. They're playing that very close to their chest. But I think you can look at things like Sentinel and the series of Sentinel satellites. So certainly within the Digital Earth Australia capability, we already run Sentinel-2 analysis-ready data that gives us that 10 metre resolution rather than the 25 or what will now be 30 metre off Landsat. And I think that's the sort of level I would expect. Um, it'll be hard to imagine the USGS not trying to aspire for 10 metre or something that allows them to work between the two. Um, but, but it's a guess. Um, I would make the point, though, the reason we're focusing on Landsat now is our honest assessment. We could be proven wrong, but our honest assessment is that the United States and our relationship with the United States Geological Survey is probably the one that's closest to one where we can influence what, not their current generation, but what their next generation of analysis-ready data will be. And we're in those conversations, and particularly um, Madhavi here, doing a lot of on-ground validation and calibration work, but the validation in particular, that's giving them quantitative estimates of where and why we think there are problems in their ARD, so that we move these discussions away from from frankly dogma and my algorithm is better than your algorithm into well, look this is this is where it doesn't work for us they're really receptive to that and i'm i am fairly confident with continued advocacy and effort we can actually get the usgs to produce a product for australia that all of australia feds states researchers industry are all comfortable using that will be a step change for for this country i would say and europe will follow shortly thereafter Let's not record that in the minutes. No. Any other questions? Stuart's very keen to get up and talk about Geo Week. Um, Dave mentioned in his presentation earlier uh, the 2019 Geo Week. So some of you may not know that in November this year, the um, ministers from the Group on Earth Observations, 105 member governments and business leaders, heads of international non-profits and experts met in Canberra for Geo Week 2019 and the Geo Ministerial Summit. The event was a huge success. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Minchin the Executive Principal Advisor for International Engagement to the stage to provide us with an overview of the week and the outcomes achieved. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, I thought that um, what I'd try and do here is give you a, uh, a quick rundown. It's mainly going to be pictures and happy snaps for, for Geo Week. Um, but I wanted to start with some context. Why did we host Geo Week? Why did Australia invest in bringing 1,500 people from all around the world into Canberra um, to discuss Earth observations. Um, and the answer really comes down to, uh, to actually a report that was released during Geo Week, which I'm going to share some numbers for you, uh, with you from. Uh, we're talking trillions again. So economic value of Earth observation. This was a study that was done uh, report looking at the value of earth and marine ob observation across the APEC economies. This is only the APEC countries, so um, those members of APEC. And this uh, study basically said that the current value to those economies today of earth observations is 372 billion US dollars. That's big numbers, right? Um, but more importantly, by 2030, only 10 years away, that's going to grow to 1.35 trillion US dollars. So there's a huge 
uh, opportunity in making use of Earth observations within our economies. It also noted that an additional 126 billion would be realisable by countries cooperating on doing things together. And we've just heard about cooperation in terms of analysis ready data, for example, and avoiding having duplicated costs in different countries where everyone has to process their own data. We're talking about um, collaboration across the whole African continent in providing Digital Earth Africa, not having uh, these countries having to do their own thing. So it's really important to realise that this is actually, um, there's a real economic reason for working with Earth observation. I'll just note that the numbers for Australia, 20 billion today, growing to 66 billion by 2030. Now, 66 billion is actually larger than the current value of our entire uh, agricultural sector. All right? So we're talking about an economic impact on the Australian economy that's equivalent to agriculture within the next 10 years. This is big stuff, right? This is not minor. And this is why we held GeoWeek, because it's our opportunity at the beginning of this decade to really uh, uh, begin a lot of that collaboration, to have a lot of uh, that engagement, to recognise that Australia is actually in a leadership role around Earth observation globally, and, uh, and to give us an opportunity to springboard off that. And Digital Earth Australia has been really a key driver in that whole process. So, uh, enough about the, the, the lectures, but I, I just wanted you to realise this, because a lot of people kind of view Earth observation as a nice scientific kind of tool or, you know, interesting um, uh, for the environment, but this is big, and I'll tell you what, our minister uh, and ministers took a lot of notice of this, so there's a, a lot of interest at the moment about um, uh, what, what Earth observations can help economically for Australia. So I'm just going to go through chronologically through the, through the week to give you an idea of what went on. So over the weekend, before the, the week, there was the Asia Oceania Geo Symposium. This is the meeting of the, uh, if you like, the regional group of geo uh, within Asia Oceania uh, region that was held at University House and was a, a great success um, with a lot of engagement across the uh, across the countries. That was my view of the day <laughs> in University House, but, um, but really, really good engagement and a lot, of, um, a lot of strong interaction and cooperation, I think, uh, between the, some of the key countries in, in Asia Oceania, um, the Asia Oceania caucus. Importantly, China, Japan and Korea have been working with Australia about making their data available to the region. And that led to some announcements uh, later in the week, which I'll, I'll mention. Uh, alongside the GEO meeting, we had the Asia-Pacific meeting of the UNGGIM. This is the UN Global Geospatial Information Management Group of Experts. So we've got a geospatial um, community in the UN, and we've got an Earth observation community in GEO. The idea was to have these two communities together and working alongside each other during this week, and that was uh, very effective. Um, we also co-hosted a UNEP um, uh, working group on big data and uh, digital ecosystems for the planet. So this is um, UNEP runs a, uh, um, or um, it's actually part of UNEA, runs a, a process um, uh, to engage industry and and others in in. The, uh, using big data for the environment. So this meeting was held in parallel as well with Geo Week. So it was a huge opportunity for a lot of the things that were, uh, were happening during, um, in, if you like, in, in the international community to come together in Canberra and to share uh, during that week. We ran a, a, a large side event program and one of the highlights of that was the Pacific Island program, um, which uh, Emma Luke uh, played a key role in, in organising. This was a huge um, step forward in engaging with the Pacific um, and, and GEO. Um, in the GEO 108 member countries, 109 now, um, we did not until this meeting have one Pacific Island country that was part of GEO. Tonga joined during this week, which is fantastic, and we've got a strong level of interest from a, a number of other Pacific Island countries in joining GEO. Because if there's one region that can um, actually 
you know, that, that critically needs this capability, it's the Pacific, with the challenges of climate change, uh, sustainable development, disasters uh, all prevalent in an area where only uh, uh, less than 3% of, um, of their region is actual land mass and they've got huge areas of ocean to cover. Um, you know, traditional approaches to measurement are not going to cut it. Um, so Earth observation is really, really powerful in this case. Um, the Pacific Island Room was very active for the whole week with Telenoa sessions going on, storytelling um, and bringing people along with the, uh, the opportunities that exist for Earth observation. There was funding announced with uh, the US, New Zealand um, and Australia all announcing uh, the funding to effectively fund the scoping of a Digital Earth Pacific capability. So um, there is money now available uh, that SPC, um, who apparently has a new boss coming, um, <laughs> will, uh, will lead a process within the Pacific to, um, to scope out what's required for Digital Earth Pacific. And it'll look quite different to Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth uh, Africa because, as I mentioned, of that large ocean area, it's going to have to have a, a different suite of products available and perhaps different um, forms of analysis-ready data because uh, analysis-ready data for land, when your land is only 3% of the, uh, the area you're dealing with, uh, may not be the most effective way of, uh, of uh, formatting the data. So um, some challenges there, but some great opportunities as well. Um, uh, Amazon announced during the week uh, at the Digital Earth Africa session um, that they are providing four petabytes of um, free data storage for Digital Earth Africa. This is huge, right? This is, we, we, we mentioned uh, wh why we're using Amazon Web Services. Um, but to have that support from a, um, you know, one of the cloud platform providers like that is, is a really big uh, achievement. At the same uh, meeting, Google announced $3 million worth of um, availability of their cloud platform to, um, to the geo countries um, to make use of. So I, I can see a future where Amazon might be the platform for Africa, Google might be the platform for the Pacific, for example, um, but they're all interoperable and they all are able to, um, to access the, the information in, in that sense. So. Um, Lots of other uh, things were announced during the week. Uh, I haven't got slides for them, but to say China announced that they are opening up a whole range of their medium resolution satellite data. This is a huge step um, forward uh, for, for China. Japan announced uh, free and open access to ALOS data globally. Um, so this will provide other tools, other uh, data sources that we can build into Digital Earth Australia into Digital Earth Africa, into Digital Earth Pacific uh, in, in the future. So really, really big um, uh, announcements. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, a, a, a really strong exhibition. This is the biggest exhibition that's ever been held at GEO um, and an industry track which brought uh, over 300 industry um, participants into the GEO week. Uh, that was a, a great success and, and one of the centrepiece uh, uh, displays was the virtual reality display that uh, was done um, together with the NCI that was making use of both Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa data to um, visualise uh, wetland um, filling and emptying events across Africa and Australia. Very popular, it really gave people an idea of um, uh, you know, the sorts of technological capability that Australia has and uh, was very popular. We even got a number of ministers to, um, to don the, the goggles and look um, stylish. <laughs> um, we gave, uh, gave our international guests a taste of uh, Australia through the Melbourne Cup event when um, uh, they, they were all a bit bemused by what this was all about to start with, but they got into the swing of things as soon as the free drinks came out. But, um, <laughs> which were not provided by the Australian government, by the way, but by our industry partners. partners. But um, it was a great event um, and, and got, a lot of, uh, um, got a lot of attention and a lot of networking happening uh, in, in the aftermath, which was, which was good. There's a picture of um, the three wise uh, monkeys on, on the right there, um, uh, representing Australia at the executive committee. Um, so this is the board of GEO, uh, and Australia has a seat on that board. 
and continues to have a seat for next year and Trevor is going to be um, uh, sitting at that, that table representing us um, uh, for, for the, next, um, the next while. The plenary meeting itself um, was uh, a big event um, and um, with, with engagement right across um, uh, 50, 53 member countries uh, and I think about 60 participating organisations turned up, which was a, a really good turnout. Uh, I must say, 1,500 people turned up to this. I was, uh, the largest event we've ever had for GEO before was 620. Um, so we more than doubled um, the, uh, the amount of um, people that, um, that attended here. And we were told that we wouldn't get anywhere near 600 people because we were far too far away. And um, uh, I took that as a challenge. <laughs> so, um, so I think, you know, fantastic job the team did in, in putting this together. It was a huge event. That was uh, the plenary opening. We had a gala dinner, which was the first time uh, that we've ever had a gala dinner in, in this sense with, with prizes and, and recognition of awards for, for individuals. It was up at the Arboretum uh, and everyone commented that that was a, a great event, a great evening. Uh, Minister Canavan was our host for the Ministerial Day um, and he did a great job of uh, representing our interests um, up, on the, up on the stage. Um, and the ministerial opening um, had uh, over 20 ministerial representatives uh, attend, which was um, the largest by far that we've ever had at a ministerial for GEO. So a great event. We had uh, tr you know, simultaneous translation going on, um, and here are the ministers all lined up, um, and one pretend one on the right. <laughs> but um, uh, it was great to, uh, to have this level of engagement, very strong engagement across uh, African ministers um, particularly, which was, which was great and that driven by the Digital Earth Africa uh, team as well. So um, the awesome team that put it together, they all lined up, uh, did a fantastic job. They did us all proud. Uh, everyone left Australia feeling like Australia really knows how to put on a show and are clearly leaders in the international um, earth observation arena. Thanks. So the industry track um, was, was an experiment. GEO is trying to connect with the commercial sector um, and tentatively you know, a number of countries were nervous about engaging with the commercial sector. So this was an opportunity for us to, to uh, strengthen that uh, in a way that was not, um, um, yeah, that was a bit lighter touch by running a parallel, parallel process. So we got a lot of commentary that it was very effective. Uh, South Africa, who are hosting the plenary next year, are planning to uh, to continue the the, um, the innovation of having an industry track, and we're going to help them and support them in that process. So I think it was uh, it was a good experiment, and um, I think uh, everyone walked away feeling like it was a, a success. Rebecca. So there's a, um, uh, there's, a, there's a bit packed into that. Um, so uh, uh, the data that we're using for these products is publicly available already. So we're not, um, we're not uh, people can choose to add their own data you know, alongside the publicly available data and, and do that if they wish. But we're not making any data available that's not already available um, to people. Uh, we're, we're just making it more useful 
in that sense. Um, there was a strong thread throughout the GO Week activities around Indigenous engagement uh, and the value of Indigenous uh, and traditional knowledge. Um, we actually had a, um, uh, I didn't put it up there, but we had a, uh, a handover ceremony where uh, the Indigenous representatives at the uh, GO Week um, uh, you know, basically handed over a, um, um, uh, a document to GO about how they would like to engage in, in future, and that was co-signed by um, uh, uh, Indigenous Australian, um, uh, Amazonian, uh, Indian, um, North American Indian um, uh, participants, um, recognising that they they um, uh, both had a lot to offer and uh, and had a lot to gain from engagement with this community. So um, yeah, there, there's a lot of active conversation going on around that, but. Um, Perhaps offline, you can have a chat to the team on about, about that further. Okay. Yeah, That brings us to the last presentation for our showcase. Um, contrary to what the slide says, this is one we call I Did a Cool Thing. Um, and for the last cool thing of 2019, I'd like to welcome Katie Dugdale to the stage. Uh, Katie's part of our 2019 Geoscience Australia graduate program. She's been working with DEA for the past six months. She's done lots of cool things during that time, but she's going to tell us about one in particular. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Alicia, for the introduction. Um, so I'll be giving a more technical talk than the others have been about three different flood mapping tools that I've developed since I've been working at Geoscience Australia. Um, so I've used two kinds of Earth observation data in this project. So I've used um, satellite data, which has a water mapping algorithm over the top of it. So it's basically 30 years worth of where has the water been in Australia. And I'm using a ground-based data set of stream gauge data. So as an example, I'll um, explain what I've done here. So this is the town of Robin Vale, which is on the Murray River, kind of near Swan Hill. And I've taken the stream gauge at Robin Vale, and I've organized the flow rate data from highest flows to lowest flows. And then I've called the satellite data from Zata Cube um, by saying, go and get the days where there was the highest flow. So I've taken these highest flows, and then that gave me 47 satellite passes that I could use. And I've layered them on top of each other and created like a water frequency map of Robin Bay. <coughs> so the yellow parts of this map mean that water was there in almost all 47 images. And the purple parts mean that water was there in probably like five or six images. So this kind of... Um, project really had a lot of uses in water and environmental management because in a regulated system you can control the flow and then using this kind of tool you can actually see where that flow is going on, especially when it breaks banks and goes onto the floodplains. And the second tool that I made which was based on that first one is a slightly different way to call satellite data. So it does the same thing. It says, go and get the highest flows. But then it also says, go and get the highest flows for one time period and compare it with the highest flows from a different time period. So this image is of a um, structure that has been built in Queensland. And it's showing that before 1998, there was no structure there. And after 98, you can see that a water storage has been built. And then what the algorithm does is it subtracts one image from the other image to give uh, like a delta image of um, where the water was before 1998, which is in red, and when there's been more water there after 1998, which is in blue. So that kind of tool has a lot of implications for um, tracking a river system over time to see how it's done when structures have been built upstream, or it could also have implications in compliance. So you could set the time before floodplain harvesting legislation came in and then after floodplain legislation came in and see if that's made a difference to the landscape or um, if people have been doing the right or wrong thing, potentially. And the third tool I made was a, um, a flood mapping tool where I wanted to see the difference between what the water looked like as it was rising 
and then what the water looked like as the flood was receding. So here's a hydrograph of Murray River at Boundary Bend. So we've got um, flow rate up this axis and then time along this axis. And I've set a threshold which represents a flooding event. And you can see the water comes up and then it goes back down and then it goes up and goes back down. So I wanted to separate the water coming up from the water going back down. And all of these red dots represent the days where we had a clear satellite pass so we can actually look at it. So then the challenge was to divide the data to get all of the satellite passes on one side of a peak and all of the satellite data on another side of the peak, which was actually very challenging. And I, um, I wanted to use a peak picking algorithm originally, but it proved to be quite fiddly. So I used the same method that Murray-Darling Basin Authority uses, which was just to say, um, get the satellite pass and then check 21 days ahead. And if the water was higher, put that in the rising category. And if the water was lower, put it in the receding category. So I've done that. And you can see that it actually worked uh, relatively well. So all of the blue dots, it's classified as rising. All of the red dots, it's classified as receding. So more or less, it's pretty good. So I was happy with that. So I went ahead and generated two images of boundary bend. So there's the water, flood water rising on the plane. And then you can see as it recedes, it like gets stuck in different pools and it comes down a different way to the water went up, which if you're a hydrologist, that could tell you quite a lot about the floodplain and um, the topography of the landscape. So those are the three tools. And um, all of these tools are publicly available on the sandbox, which Dave was talking about in his presentation. So if you're interested in using them, um, you can. And all the data is available as well. So uh, I'll be sticking around. I'm going to the cafe after this. So if you're interested in potentially using it, you can come find me. Thank you. I'm actually not, sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's terrible. I know, yeah, yeah the, the department won me back with a promotion, so. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry. So how, did, how do you feel the secondment went from your perspective? Um, for me, it was very valuable. So the whole reason I came over here in the first place was to learn Python. Um, so I'm actually with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science and they let me come here on secondment for six months to learn Python, um, which I have. So that's been really useful for me. It was the first time I've worked with large data sets, um, such as satellite data. And now I'm feeling quite confident that I can manipulate large data sets and code Python to do that. So it was really, really worthwhile for me. And I, I think it's been worthwhile for DEA to have somebody else able to work on these projects that have kind of been on the back burner for a while and have now come to fruitation. So hopefully there'll be a bit of a bit more graduate exchange between the department and geoscience in the future. Any other questions for Kate? Uh, I did, but I feel like it's a bit of a double on that. That was a great question. Uh, let me ask you one: Where did the stream gauge data come from? So the stream gauge data is a public data set held by Bureau of Meteorology, yeah. and um, it's all of the gauges are kind of maintained by the state governments and local governments, and then BOM. Um, collates are all in a regular format so that you can use Australia-wide data, which is really useful. So, and it's a question part of the, and possibly for David as well. You know, we've toyed with trying to enable the sort of case, some of the much more basic things that you did on tools like the National Map. How, because everything you did has been a, you know, kind of Python Jupyter environment, right? Yeah. How far off are we of having that in a National Map time frame? Uh, so we're we're pretty close. I mean, the, the NEII viewer does uh, provide uh, some different kinds of stream gauge data, so it's kind of why I'm sounding a little bit uncertain, because I just know that there is a, there is a difference between some of them. Um, I mean, that was, uh, for those who aren't aware, that was actually a point of investment for DEA for the last, um, for the last 18 months. Uh, it's actually driven a lot of new features into the national map or Terrier, Terrier platform so that we can do that kind of uh, analysis in terms of 
having a hydrograph down the bottom of the screen and uh, overlaying satellite overpasses on top of them. Uh, we are still working on getting the data right and usable, but it is actually available today. Yeah, and um, I will just add to that, Trevor, that it's really good having it in the raw form at the moment on the sandbox because we're now able to collaborate with Murray Darling Basin Authority and Commonwealth Environmental Water Office and some New South Wales state governments on the tools before they go all the way to being properly developed with a proper user interface. Um, so you know, the capability at Murray Darling Basin, for example, to collaborate with us on these tools is actually quite high. So we've, um, uh, we're working with them now and they're on the other end of the sandbox and they're able to look at these tools and use them and get back to us with feedback or see what it might be useful for them. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the uh, final public showcase for 2019. We hope you, that you've enjoyed it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a few of us will be hanging around. Katie will be in the cafe <laughs> and have a coffee with her. Um, our contact details are on the screen. We really encourage you to reach out and engage with us, particularly if you've got any feedback about the showcases that you've seen so far. Um, I spruiked it last time, I'll spruik it again. If you are a visitor to GA, please take your time to look at the minerals and fossils collection, and in particular, the only lunar touchstone in the Southern Hemisphere, which was collected from the moon from the 17th Apollo mission in 1972. Did I get that right? <laughs> it's two. It's two. It's two. It says two here. <laughs> um, if you're heading off straight away, I wish you all a happy and safe holiday season for you and your loved ones and uh, we look forward to welcoming you to GA again in 2020. Thank you.